Welcome. I'm Deborah Polsky, and I'm the executive director of the Dallas Jewish Historical Society. And we want to welcome you to the Jim Schwartz annual lecture series. We have um, the honor of having our lecture series named for Jim, who was a past president of our organization, as well as being an integral part of the Dallas Jewish community in the many other organizations with whom he served. Um, and it has been our honor for the last few years to have this lecture series named for him. The Dallas Jewish Historical Society is celebrating our 50th anniversary this year. We collect and preserve our, uh, artifacts, papers, photos, anything you can think of that tell about your history, the history of the Jews in Dallas. And we also uh, have an, a library, the Morton Wachowski Archive of Oral History Interviews. If you have not done one and would like to, let us know. We're happy to do it. Right now, I'd like to introduce you to Mitch Myers, who is the chairman of our program committee, and he will introduce tonight's speaker. Thank you Thanks. for being here. Thank you, Deborah. So I'd like to introduce uh, Andy Hill. Andy uh, grew up in Los Angeles, um, all city basketball player in high school, always dreamed of playing at UCLA for coach John Wooden. He played on the 1970 to 72 college, UCLA college team, won three national championships. Uh, and the experience he had at UCLA was anything other than a dream. And he'll tell you a little bit about that. He moved into a successful career in television, became the president of CBS Productions, was responsible for such shows as Touched by an Angel, Dr. Quinn, Medicine Woman, and my grandmother Nana's favorite, Walker, Texas Ranger, starring Chuck Norris. <laughs> and uh, the story is 25 years after leaving UCLA, Coach Wooden had, or Andy had an epiphany about what he was doing in his life. And he's going to tell you about that. 20 years ago, I saw Andy Hill at Congregation Sheriff Israel. And uh, he was a motivating speaker. He's motivating me. And he told me, uh, not just me, but everybody in the audience to, uh, to go home that night and think about the person that was an inspiration to you growing up, whether it was a coach or a teacher. And uh, I did. I called Coach Bobby Dietz, who was my coach in elementary school. And he's actually on this program tonight. And I had not seen Coach or talked to him for a while for a while, not only was he got me instrumental in playing basketball in third grade, but he also was, was a referee and I saw him all through high school and I lost touch with him. And once I got back in touch with coach, it was like we hadn't been apart and we're just good friends now. We stay in touch um, all the time. So I wanted to thank Andy for that. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Andy. So thank you, Andy, for joining us tonight. I'm really looking forward to your discussions. And if anybody has any questions, please put it in the chat box and we will ask Andy. He loves the Q&As. So thank you. Well, thank you, Mitch. Uh, it's nice to be here. I think we have a minion. It's close. Uh, it, it, it's always a treat for me to talk about coach because uh, I've retired from doing this. I used to do it all the time. And of course, whenever I get a chance to talk about him, I feel like I'm spending time with him. And I miss him. He's been gone now for about 13 years. And, uh, you know, so getting a chance to talk to some people who haven't had the opportunities that I've had to get to know him about who he was and why he was so special is, is actually a real treat for me. So Mitch, thank you for the invitation. Uh, for those of you who don't know a lot about Coach, uh, you know, the first thing to know, of course, is he was 
the greatest coach ever. Uh, that's uh, what a Sporting News poll taken about 10 years ago said in a landslide. He was the greatest coach ever. He won 10 championships in 12 years. He won 88 straight games, 38 straight tournament games. Records that will never be approached, that, that, that's for sure. But, of course, to me, what made him so special was that he was also the happiest man I ever met. And hopefully I can, in talking about him tonight, give you some insight into why that was the case. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I don't get a chance to talk to Jewish groups all that often, but a uh, big shock to you. John Wooden was not Jewish. He was about as not Jewish as anybody I know. And, uh, you know, I, I've said it before. I'll say it again. There's nothing in the world better than a really good Christian. They're just really hard to find. And John Wooden was a really good Christian. Uh, and, 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 and to describe him, it, 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 it's, 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 it's almost impossible, but to give you some sense of what he was like, he was incredibly smart. He was also really tough. Now, by the way, he seemed like a sweet little old guy to people who didn't know him. But John Wooden was, uh, in his day as a basketball player, like Michael Jordan. He, he was a rough and tough player and uh, got in plenty of fights and a scrappy guy. But he was also incredibly honest. He was, had great personal discipline. He was also, by the way, remarkably humble. And it's something that I think a lot of people have a tough time understanding because he was very confident, but he was humble. Uh, he knew he was a very, very good basketball coach. He just didn't think that made him any better than anyone else. Uh, he was also, by the way, uh, you know, and I came from, a, you know, kind of unhappy Jewish household where my folks got divorced when I was uh, in, in my early 20s. John Wooden was the most romantic man I ever met. Deeply, deeply in love with his wife long after she had passed away. Uh, his wife passed away on the 21st and, and, and on the 21st of every month after that. And I used to speak to really big groups of people and I could see the women in the audience thinking, God, isn't this wonderful? And the men in the audience thinking, oh boy, am I going to catch hell for this? On the 21st of the, each month, John Wooden used to write his deceased wife a love letter and put it under her pillow. So I'd never really met anybody quite like him. He was, he was really, really different. But, you know, as Mitch mentioned, I went to UCLA to play. I was a highly recruited high school star. And I went there. I was the co-most valuable player of a freshman team with a guy named Henry Bibby who went on to a very successful career in the pros and uh, unfortunately I then sat on the bench and watched for three years as we went 87 and three and and won three national championships and you know when you're uh, 18 19 20 years old you have a very different perspective on life and of course I sort of assumed that it the only reason he wasn't playing me was he didn't like me because, of course, why else wouldn't he play me? Well, of course, you know, now as an adult, when you were running a business of your own, what you realized was you, you didn't do things because you liked people or you didn't like them. You did them because you needed the best people in the lineup to be playing. And that was the biggest part of his job. So when I left UCLA, I, I really kind of thought that that was the end for Coach and I, that we would probably never see each other again. And, 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 and that was fine with me. I mean, I, I went on and married my high school sweetheart and had some beautiful kids and a great career. And uh, then I had the great good fortune to be fired by a horrible guy at CBS by the name of Leslie Moonbez. And uh, I did get a couple of years to, uh, you know, play golf and kind of figure out what I wanted to do with my life. And more importantly, what, what was I good at? And, uh, you know, it was starting to become pretty clear to me over time that actually what I was good at was I was good at getting a bunch of people who were talented but tended to be kind of egomaniacal. If this sounds like any of your businesses, you know, it's like every business. But 
I was dealing with television personalities and, you know, the more talented, the more crazy they were. And yet somehow I had to get them to work together as a group towards a common goal. Now, you know, I sound pretty stupid now, but over time I kind of came to understand that sounds like a lot like a basketball coach. And uh, one day I was out on the golf course playing poorly. And uh, the guy I was playing with said to me, Andy, slow down. It's your balance. You're hurrying. Now, these were all things that Coach said over and over and over again. He repeated himself constantly in his teaching. And it was like having Obi-Wan Kenobi sitting on my shoulder. It was kind of eerie. It was like, whoa, hey, Coach, wow, okay. Now, I, I don't know if any of you on this call are golfers, but, uh, you know, it, 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 in my experience as a golfer, like every once in a while, I mean, every once in a while, like once a year, you, before you hit the ball, you knew it was going to be really good. And this was one of those bizarre times when before I even hit the ball, I knew somehow this was going to be really good. And uh, I hit about as good a shot as I've ever hit in my life. And in that wonderful, awful moment, I realized, I needed to call my old coach, not because I wanted to, but because I felt I had to. I felt that he had taught me a lot and that I needed to say thank you. And really that was the total totality of what I expected out of this phone call. Now, I should tell you, I had a phone number for coach, but uh, it was so old, it didn't have an area code. I see some older folks on this phone call who do remember the dark ages of rotary dial phones and no area code. But I knew where he lived. He lived in the valley, and that was an 818 area code. And, and, and it took me about a day and a half to actually dial the phone. I mean, I've made difficult phone calls running a TV studio, you know, telling people they were fired, telling people they were off the show, telling people we weren't doing their show. Those are tough phone calls. But this was really hard. This was not eating crow. It was eating a boxcar filled with crows to call up Coach Wooden and say, Coach, you were right. I was wrong. Thank you for everything. So I finally dialed that number and, you know, it rang a few times. And then I got the greatest sound you can possibly get when you make a phone call like this. The answering machine picked up. I was so relieved. Oh, I don't have to talk to him. I'll just leave him a message. Well, the phone goes beep and... Uh, you know, this had been 25 years. I didn't know if Coach would remember me. And then I thought to myself, well, actually, Andy, he'll remember you. He just didn't much like you. So, that you know, what's the, what's the upside here? But I realized I just need to leave a message. So I said, hi, Coach, this is Andy Hill. And bang, he picked that phone up so fast. He said, where are you? Just like that. And honestly, I went right back to 25 years earlier. And I said, what do you mean, where am I? Where are you? And he said, uh, Took a deep breath and he said, well, you know, God, your old coach would love to see you. When are you going to come visit? And I did go to see him the next day. We spent four hours together talking about leadership and life. And as it turned out, all of my ideas I'd taken from him, which took me a while to come to terms with. But in hindsight, not a bad idea to steal your leadership concepts from the greatest coach ever. And, and, and at the end of four hours, I, I, I had really just called and thought I'd leave a message. At, at this point, at the end of four hours, I thought, oh, my God, I could actually end up having a relationship with John Wooden. And I got in my car. I went around the corner. and I cried for 10 minutes. I, I thought, my God, I, I may actually have a, a real relationship with this guy that I'd wanted all my life. And as it turned out, I got more than I ever could have hoped for. As Mitch mentioned earlier, if you get nothing else out of this, pick up the phone and call somebody tomorrow you haven't talked to in a long time. Yes, they do remember you. It could be your junior high school teacher. I don't care how old you are, they do remember you. And uh, that was a life-changing call for me. It uh, turned into a beautiful, beautiful friendship. I didn't have a great relationship with my own dad and you know, now I had somebody kind of between a dad and a granddad, sort of the, both the best worlds. It was, it was pretty remarkable. And, and, of course, you know, Coach's whole philosophy ends up getting kind of boiled down to this pyramid of success that he spent the rest of his life post-coaching teaching to people. 
And at the end of the day, the pyramid really comes down to how he looks at success. And this was really kind of a game changer for me. I mean, I'd grown up as a Jewish kid. Success was getting into a really good school, getting a good degree, and making a nice amount of money while I have a nice family and go to shul and my kids get bar mitzvah. That's success. And of course, you know, here I was in the entertainment business where I saw people who were on the outside, unbelievably successful, had attained great amounts of money, power, and fame, and yet they weren't very happy. In fact, once people became really, really rich and powerful, none of them seemed to be happy. So what was it that this guy, John Wooden, what was his secret that he had up his sleeve that, you know, allowed him to both be incredibly accomplished and really successful? And it's simply the way that he viewed success, which was not in terms of the attainment of money, power, and fame, but actually in the realization of your own potential, uh, self-actualization, if you will, if you're a Maslow fan. But at the end of the day, it's about coming as close as you can to realizing your own potential, being who you could possibly be and working on it so that you get closer to it every day. And, and, and Coach did that. He did that for 99 years. He kept work and he kept trying to get better. And, and it, is that, it is that ability to change and that sense of control in recognizing that you can that makes you happy. Because at the end of the day, there's very little in life that we do control. And if you can take control of that one thing that you actually do have control over, if you'll admit it, which is your own life, grab the steering wheel and say, how do I need to get better? What do I need to do to get better? So what I want to do is sort of leave you with a few quick stories, and then hopefully we can do some Q&A. Uh, the first one is about the, the urgency of committing to self-improvement. You know, the problem with self-improvement is it's hard and uh, we like to be right. So if we say we can't do it, well, we're right because we don't try. And if we say that we can do it, well, the challenge starts right away and it's challenging every day. So it's easy not to try. But of course, that doesn't really lead to success. Success comes from having a sense of I've got to get it done, a sense of real determination and, and, and urgency about it. So near the end of Coach's time on earth, uh, one day we were driving to, to breakfast and I said to him, Coach, I, I'm just curious, uh, do you have any regrets in life? And what surprised me not wasn't that he did, but how quickly he came back with it. He was, he was clear on his regret. What was his regret? His regret was, remember before I told you he was the most romantic guy I ever met. Well, he said, oh, you know, I have a big regret. He said, oh, my Nelly, she loved to dance. And because I was a shy farm boy, I never learned how. And, and, and I really regret that. I should have learned how to dance. And, you know, I think to myself, if you're thinking, uh, you know, would Coach have done it if he had another chance? Uh, Coach would have been on Dancing with the Stars. He would have been, you know, he would have been Gene Kelly. But he didn't get another chance but you've got a chance while you're here. So if there's something you want to move on to and take a shot at, do it, but do it now. Don't wait. Someday is code for never. I'll get to it someday means you ain't going to do it. So get on it and get it done. Next story is a very personal one for me. I, I will admit that, you know, Coach and I did end up having a really, uh, a, just an unbelievable relationship. In the beginning, I, you know, I, I couldn't quite believe it was happening. And, you know, I do like to feel like I kind of had some real impact on him too. Uh, you know, he hadn't been around a lot of Jewish kids before. And I was pretty out there with, uh, you know, expressing what I thought, and what my emotions were, and you know, not exactly the way he grew up. And one day we were going to do a TV show called Power Lunch with Bill Griffith on CNBC. And uh, we were driving in my wife's SUV because I couldn't put him in my little sports car. He was pretty infirm. And we're driving up the 134 going towards Burbank. And, and, and out of the blue, with no prelude, 
John Wooden says to me, Andy, have I ever told you how much I love you? And how much I appreciate that you picked up the phone and called me. Well, the, the, the first thing I thought I was going to do was drive off the freeway, but I had my wife's car. I didn't have permission, so I didn't do that. And the, the next thing I thought to myself was, I'm going to start to cry. I've, I've waited my whole life to hear this from a man I had feelings for, and now I'm hearing it from John Wooden. Wow. But I knew, you know, he had a goyish cup, and I thought if I started to cry, I'm going to freak this old dude out. So I didn't do that. I just took a deep breath and I said, you know, coach, uh, thank you. Thank you. It's so great to hear that from you. And I love you too. But it's what, it's what at that point, 93 year old John Wooden said back to me that I want to kind of plant in your head, 93 years old. He said, Andy, I've been working on expressing my emotions and I think I'm getting a little better at it. That's at 93. So you wanna know why he was happy? He was happy because he kept getting better. And then what I wanna kind of close with is, is the last time John Wooden ever spoke publicly. Now, now, John Wooden was the greatest motivational speaker I ever saw. I went to see him a hundred times. I wish I could go tomorrow, I'd go in a second. He was fantastic. He was also the greatest coach ever. But this speech happened to be the last speech he ever gave that happened to also be when sports, Sporting News was giving his award, him an award as the greatest coach ever. That's a pretty big deal. Greatest ever. Not greatest college coach, greatest basketball coach, greatest ever. So what did he say? Well, the first thing he did, you could almost sort of guess. The first thing he did was he looked at his players. There were 10 of us there. I was sitting next to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the greatest of all time, and Marcus Johnson, the winner of the first John Wooden Award, and Andy Hill, a little Jewish guy at the end of the bench. So, you know, what was I doing there? But the first thing he did is he said, you know, these, these fellas here, they're the ones who deserve all the credit. Uh, you know, I just like to think I helped. And... Of course, you know, I turned to Kareem, who was sitting next to me. I said, hey, and I had on my NCAA championship watch. I said, Kareem, I got three of these. You got three of them. I said, doesn't he have 10? Kareem said, yeah, and that's he's why we both have three. But that was coach, very natural to just give credit to other people. But uh, then, then, then the last thing he really got to was to talk about what he considered to be uh, the one mistake that he'd made in his pyramid of success. Now, I want you to think about this. Last speech he ever gives, he's known for this pyramid of success. He's lectured about it everywhere. At that point, I'd been lecturing about it for 10 years. And in his last speech, he says, oh, I made a mistake. Who does that but John Wooden? What was the mistake? He said, I left the most important word out of the English, in the English language, out of my pyramid of success. That word is love, L-O-V-E, love. Not love as an emotion, but, you know, love like they talk about in 2 Corinthians, love that's patient and kind, doesn't boast, always, always, always patient and helpful. And, and, and that's the love that John Wooden was talking about. Of course, he then throws in a little poem because he had a million poems and sayings, uh, you know, a song in the song until you sing it, bell in the bell until you ring it. And the love that's inside you wasn't put there to stay. Love isn't love till you give it away. That was basically where he finished speaking. But it was also where all of us up there were, you know, holding back our tears and in most cases not holding them back very well because we realized we had had the opportunity to be mentored and coached by the greatest ever. But he was not just the greatest ever when he was sitting on the bench. He was the greatest ever every day of his life. He had a very clear philosophy. He taught it and he lived it. There's a nice little expression. It goes, there is a choice you have to make in everything you do. And you must always keep in mind the choice you make makes you. Choose to be like coach. You can keep changing. 
You can get better. I see some old dogs on this phone call. I know I can teach you some new tricks. And the great thing about it is nobody will be happier for it than you will. So let's do some questions. Let's, uh, let, 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 let me see what I, if I can answer your question. I got a, I got a few, Andy, for you. Okay, uh, good. They could come from all over the country. Uh, the first one is, uh, did you have any Jewish teammates at UCLA? And were there any Jewish coaches or staff uh, at UCLA as well, as well when you were there? That's pretty easy. The answer is no. <laughs> but my experience as a Jewish basketball player was I was a Jewish kid. And, you know, I think that to some degree, honestly, I'll tell you an interesting story. I, I, I'm very, very close with some of my former teammates. And, and because of that, and only because I chose to play basketball and not tennis and golf, I have very, very close African-American friends, which doesn't happen in America much because we're very segregated. And, and, and one of my best friends, a fellow by the name of Mike Warren, he was my hero growing up. He was on Hill Street Blues. And one day we were talking about something dealing with race. And, and, and he said, Andy, I don't understand. He said, you never sound like a white guy when we talk about this stuff. And I said, uh, well, actually, Mike, I've never felt like a white guy. I'm a Jew. And uh, it was interesting because he, you know, for him, that was kind of a revelation that, you know, and I said to him, I said, Mike, my, my family that didn't leave Europe died in Europe. I'm a Jew. I'm not a white guy. And, you know, I think it's an interesting thing that we're unfortunately probably experiencing more today than we have at any other point in my lifetime. Okay, great. So uh, also the question was, uh, was being Jewish ever an issue with players? I know you talked about Coach Wooden uh, wanted everybody to have balance, good balance. He even had good racial balance. He, he had good balance from different kinds of people. So uh, was there any issues with you? And also, can you talk a little bit about the timing of what was going on in UCLA in 1970s on the campus, early 70s? Well, I mean, you know, we were in the middle of the Vietnam War. Campus was just on fire. Uh, you know, a lot of political rallies. And, you know, it was indescribably different than what it is today. Of course, you know, let's not get carried away. We didn't have a volunteer army then. So guys were worried about going to war and getting killed. I'm not sure we were that much more uh, committed. We, we, we just had a bit of reason to be committed. And uh, no, I never, you know, there were times I kind of thought, gee, you know, maybe, maybe if I went to those fellowship of Christian athletes meetings, he'd like me better. But at the end of the day, I think I probably just wasn't good enough, Mitch. Okay. Well, don't be so hard on yourself, Andy. I think it went, <laughs> it went well. Uh, another question was what kept the players, such as yourself, <clears throat> that were non rotational players? motivated at practice uh, to work hard? What a great question. Well, first of all, uh, Mitch, you, you were a ball player, right? Yeah. What's better than playing against the best guys in the world? That's it. Right? Yeah. They give you, a, they give you clean stuff every day, right? Clean stuff to change into. They roll out these beautiful basketballs in this gorgeous brand new gym. I get to play against Bill Walton every day. Are you kidding me? <laughs> So that was a lot of fun. Also, the other thing is Coach Wooden's practices were, in fact, a lot of fun. We loved practice. He didn't talk. It was boom, 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 drill to drill to drill to drill. And it was, you know, it, it was intense and it was fantastic. Uh, you know, the question I do get asked a lot is why didn't I go somewhere else where I could have played? And the embarrassing true answer is, I kept thinking Henry had to get hurt, <laughs> and he never did. In the three years I was at UCLA, this is, this is mind-boggling when you look at what happens now in basketball. I think a lot of it is because there's too much weight training. Uh, in the three years I was at UCLA, no one missed a game. No one. Yeah, it seems like they had better shooters back then than, than now. I mean, they shoot farther away now. But, uh... 
the weights do make a difference. I mean, yes. it's just hard to have any touch, right? Well, I think it also it, it over strengthens certain <clears throat> things in your body that that that, uh, that just creates too much stress. And then, of course, you know, these guys are doing too much weight training. They just are. Coach thought weight training was fingertip push-ups. <laughs> Still don't. <laughs> so, uh, do you notice the teachings of Coach Wooden, uh, his pyramid of success used today in business or in sports? Besides yourself, obviously, through. Well, I'll give you. Yeah. I'll give you a great example. Let me go all the way back to uh, Sunday, when the Los Angeles Rams win the Super Bowl, and what does Sean McVay talk about? Competitive greatness, yeah. being at your best when your best is needed. I have a pyramid right on top of my thing here. What does it say? Competitive greatness. Be at your best when your best is needed. Pure, straight up, John Wooden. You're straight up. Yep. Uh, a question is, do you think, no matter your age, that the ability to change is the key to happiness? Yes. Well, it, 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 keep in mind, there are, two, there are two components, ability and will. You can have the will and not have the, everybody has the ability. I believe everybody has the ability to change. The question is, do they have sufficient will to change? And I will say this, I've been married for 47 years. It is easier for me to change than to get my wife to change. I love her to death, but trust me, it's easier to change yourself than to change someone else. Absolutely. So there's your pyramid of success. And what Coach McVay was talking about is right there at the top, competitive greatness. Right. He talked about that ad nauseum, right? So word, 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 and, and, and word for word, yes. Yes. Yeah, word for word. Uh, by the way, what I would say, honestly, I don't know this to be true. My guess is, you know, I've never met Sean McVay. My guess is Sean McVay uh, knows that's a John Wooden quote. But there are an awful lot of people who have adapted his philosophy without knowing where it came from. And the one thing I would say about coaches, he wouldn't care. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't care that, hey, you know, you didn't, you didn't give me crap. He wouldn't care. He would be happy to be of help. Uh, you know, coach uh, really did understand that uh, the road to happiness uh, was paved with the hunger to give, not the hunger to get. And that people who really spend their life giving are the happy ones. And the people who want, who want stuff, who think that things will make them happy, don't end up very, very happy. I have a question here. It was a very succinct question. Was John Wooden funny? Well, by the way, can I just say this for a small group? These are great questions because the answer to that is, is, is a real insight into John Wooden. John Wooden was really funny. But when we were under his supervision on the team, we had no idea. Now, I want you to think about that for a second. Humor, of course, you know, Jews use humor more than anybody else. That's why all the sitcoms are by Jewish writers. But John, I, you know, and I did sitcoms, and, 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 and I know from funny, and he is funny. <laughs> but the idea that when he was in charge, Humor brings people closer. And he knew that as the coach, as the CEO, it wasn't his job to be friends with the players. It was his job to be in charge. And so uh, he held that back from us, which I didn't realize until like 20 years ago, long after you know I had known him for years and as adults, did I realize, wow, he just kept this under wraps to be a more effective leader. By the way, I, I, before you get to another story, Mitch, there is one other story I want to tell because I think it's important, uh, which, which is uh, a characteristic that Coach had that I thought made him really different, and it was really impactful for me. Uh, one day I was sitting in his office. Uh, I'd been there about three or four times now. We were starting to be friends, but I wasn't sure if I really trusted it yet. 
And, and, and he had this big old desk. If you ever go to UCLA, they actually have his office in the Hall of Fame. It's fantastic. You should go see it. The only thing they did wrong was they cleaned it up. His desk was a mess, just like mine, except he knew where everything was. It had all these little cubby holes. He reaches into this little cubby hole, he pulls his card out, and he starts reading from the, this list of leadership things that he thought were important. And he got to like number seven. And number seven was, you know, you got to spend extra time encouraging the people who aren't getting the spotlight because the people who are getting the spotlight, they, they don't need that much more. Uh, he didn't do that. He, he ignored us like it was unbelievable. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself, well, Andy, you're sitting here with John Wooden and this is going really nice. So here we are, we can do one or two things. You can keep your big Jewish mouth shut for a change, <laughs> or you can just pipe up like you always do and say, coach, you didn't do that. Well, I guess you can kind of figure which one won, right? The wise-ass Jew boy who says, coach, you didn't do that. And what happened next really changed our relationship. He took a beat and he said, uh, Oh, well, if that's what you experienced, I'm really sorry. I should have done better. There was no defensiveness. It was just, I'm sorry. I had an alcoholic dad. I never heard those words before. I'm sorry. And when you own them, like he did, and by the way, there was no if in front of it, not if, I just told him that he hadn't done it. So he didn't need to put if in front of it. It's amazing how people always stick if into an apology when they know there's no if involved. He just owned it clearly and sincerely. And it was an extraordinary thing because I, I had not really experienced that before, just someone owning their behavior like he did. My wife just said, you say if, and you also say but. That one too, Mitch. There you go. So um, another question was, coach did not seem to be actively coaching during games. And can you explain that? Because he, he talked about, you talked about how he would just sit on the bench. And if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Sure. Uh, there's a really, really, it's just about one word, one really big important word that, that really, was something that coach communicated in the locker room before the game and then communicated during the game. Trust. He trusted us. He spent all week coaching us. If we hadn't figured it out by then, what was he going to tell us during the game? I mean, honest to God, aren't you always amazed when you're watching one of these NBA games? They've played 173 games. There's four seconds left, and the coach is on the sideline with this with this paper, you know, writing a play out. It's like, you're going to run a play you haven't run before? Mitch, you played basketball. You know better than that. No, you can run a play you practiced 50 times before. Yeah. But they're all trying to make it look like they're doing something. And then, of course, when they make the mistake of putting that microphone in the coach's huddle, you realize they're not saying anything anyhow. Right? Let's, let's rebound. Right? Run the floor. Find the open man. What do they say? Nothing that your third grade basketball coach didn't tell you. It's just they're getting paid $10 million a year to say it. So, you know, and coach didn't call timeouts. He didn't call timeouts, A, because he had very little to say. But he actually, this was, this was in the days before the games all had these massive TV timeouts where the, the referee just called timeout for nothing. And the way that he sold it to us, was why would I call timeout? It gives them a chance to rest. Now, he had convinced us that we were in better condition than the other team. I have no idea whether or not it was physiologically true, but it was mentally true. And if you've ever played any sport where you get tired, what you know is it's all mental. You've always got something left in the tank. And, and, and it is only the great coaches that can get you to get that out of there. And, and, and that's what he was great at. That's great, Andy. Um, do, you, do you think recruiting or recruits in high school basketball is similar today 
to when you were recruited out of high school. And can you just talk a little bit how Coach Wooden would recruit his players, which is completely different than what they Well, I, I, my heart goes out to these kids today. You know, first of all, I played basketball because I love basketball. There was no money in basketball. You know, no one was getting rich playing basketball. Now these kids all think this is about getting rich. And, uh, you know, the social media gets uh, people focused on these kids when they're in the eighth grade, the ninth grade. I mean, I got to be a child. These poor kids don't get to be children. They, they're, 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 they're monetized and marketed from the time they're 14 years old. Uh, you know, and now that they have these NILs where they can pay these kids to go to school. And, and by the way, mark my words, there will be an enormous gambling scandal in the next two or three years. If <laughs> pro sports really thinks that they can embrace gambling and take all the money out of it and they're not going to have huge problems, they are kidding themselves. It's just a matter of time. So, you know, and then the other thing is, and, and this is where it gets kind of corny. I mean, you know, I went to UCLA because I wanted to come running out of the tunnel with the music playing, you know. Da, 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 da. These kids all want to be on Sports Center in the highlight reel. And the highlight's all about them, right? It's all focused on them. And, 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 and I did a lot of executive coaching at Fox Studios. The one thing that I would harp on all the time with my executives is, please don't blame these kids for being the way they are. They didn't go buy a participation trophy so that the kid who came in 73rd gets a trophy. They didn't decide that if you just show up, turn in your work, and don't cuss out the teacher that you get a B, and if you look like you can speak, you get an A. Nobody gets a C anymore. C used to be average. Now C is a failing grade. And when you're, you know, I remember when my parents went to parent teacher night at my elementary school, it was like they were going to see the judge who was going to tell them whether or not their kid had to, you know, had to be on probation. Now the parents go to parent teacher night to tell the teacher what they got to do better because their kid doesn't like it. I mean, so we've, we've created a much different structure for these kids. Coach Wooden's Coach Wooden's recruitment was simple. This is a great school. You'll have a great opportunity to play here. And by the way, when I say great opportunity, that's all. It wasn't you're going to start, we're going to feed you the ball. It was you will have an opportunity to play here. And, and that was it. And everybody else would tell you how they were going to run plays for you and they were going to do this for you, and then and he didn't do that. Which is partially why he got his great players that he got were unselfish because that didn't appeal to them. I mean, when the two greatest players you have in your program, Kareem and Bill Walton are both super unselfish guys. It makes it easier to make that spread through the whole program. That's great. That's great. Does Bill Walton talk too much? <laughs> Bill's my best friend. We talk every day. Yes. He talks too much all the time. He talks and talks and talks and he's, <laughs> the greatest he's the greatest guy ever that's great somebody asked uh, his relationship with coach wood uh similar to yours how he reached out as well or he stayed in touch coach and bill and i had some unbelievably great times we we we, we really and, and by the way because that earlier question about was coach funny the one thing i remember is boy we laughed we laughed so much it was just so much fun and 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 you know it's fascinating to me because i i really I have one really good friend from show business. I was in show business for 23 years. And it was a guy who created two shows for me, Caroline in the City and Dave's World, and I fired him twice. And he's the only friend I have from show business. My best friends are the guys I played ball with. I've got another question. This one's from New York. You got to like that. New York, all right. Please ask if where he is today, where you are today, and is where you expect it to be. And if not, where did you expect to be? And how did the game of basketball help you adjust to that change in perspective? I'm living the dream, Mitch. I, I have outkicked my coverage. I, you know, I'm the luckiest guy in the world. My buddy Bill will tell you it's him, but no, it's me because he was actually really good at basketball. I mean, you know, I, I got fired by CBS, and I thought that was the end of my life. It's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. 
You know, I've been very lucky to find that the worst things that happened to me were really <laughs> the best things. It got me back with coach, got me to write a book, got me to retire early and make a career out of doing motivational speaking, something that I absolutely love doing. Uh, I really struggled with, you know, staying in the entertainment business because I realized that if you don't, if you don't lie, cheat and steal, it's kind of hard to keep up. And, you know, I'm not going to change the world, but I'm also not going to change me to adjust to that kind of mentality. So, you know, I was very fortunate to find something else and, uh, you know, to have a beautiful family and uh, wonderful kids. I've got a uh, fourth grandchild showing up in March. Uh, Life is better than I ever could have imagined. Fabulous. Thank you. Uh, got a question here that's uh, wanted to know if you have seen The Grateful Dead with Bill Wall. Many times, yes. <laughs> so and you went backstage. Ever, and, and by the way, if you ever want to go to a Grateful Dead concert, go with Bill Wall. <laughs> You, 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 you go in and you talk to the guys in the band and you tell them what songs you want to hear and, and, and you eat from their buffet. There's nothing quite like it. Wow, fabulous, fabulous. That's, that sounds like fun. Uh, there's a question. What's the key difference between a good coach and a great coach like Coach Wood? Uh, you know, I, I, I'm sure there are lots of them. I, you know, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, to me, uh, you evaluate a coach with three very clear parameters. Does the team play hard? Does the team play together? And does the team get better as the year goes on? And that, to me, if you evaluate, you know, it's a pretty simple system to evaluate someone. Play hard, play together, get better. If they do those three things, you got a good coach. If they don't, you need a new one. Need a new coach. Um, a question I got from the book, and don't take this the wrong way, were you dense or was this the way Coach Wooden planned it all along? <laughs> I think I was dense. <laughs> I think I was dense. I, I mean, come on. I, weren't we all sort of stupid when we were 19? I, God, if we weren't, you know, too bad. I'm sorry you didn't get the chance to experience the joy of 19-year-old stupidity and doing really dumb stuff. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, I was an idiot. Thank you. Thank you for pointing that out, Mitch. I appreciate it. <laughs> Just stuck with me. It was a great line. Thank you. <laughs> so Coach Wooden used to roll up a newspaper and coach with that sitting on the bench. Was there anything in that rolled up newspaper or paper that he had in there? Well, what was in there, and this is not well known, Mitch, but uh, what was in there, uh, for those of you who don't know, Coach was from Indiana. That's where the best trash talkers are from. Two best trash talkers of all time, John Wooden and Larry Bird. People don't know that. From Indiana, that's right. Wow. And Coach would sit there with that little program and he would jaw it, guys. And I'll tell you a great story. We were, it's in the book. We were playing University of California and they had a terrific kid named Jackie Ridgel from Arkansas. So he was a small town kid but he was averaging like 25 points a game. And we were playing at the Harmon gym in, in Berkeley, where I think, you know, the Coca-Cola was infused with LSD. I mean, it was just wild up there. They had a lot of really good players, but they had a terrible coach. And, 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 uh, and they didn't share the ball much, shall we say. And so this guy, Jackie Ridgel, the first four or five times down the court, nobody's throwing him the ball. And somebody is ragging on him. Hey, Jackie, how are you going to get your points? They never throw you the ball. How come they don't throw you? The don't they like you? Well, finally, after about five minutes, Jackie turns over and looks at the bench. And who is ragging him? John Wooden. And he couldn't believe it. It was like, oh, my God, this John Wooden is sitting here ragging on me. I don't think Jackie touched the ball the rest of the He was just gone. Coach just took him out of the game. So, you know, Mitch, when you roll that program up, you got to give not him a telescope. Good. It's a it's a megaphone. Right. Well, just so you know, when I coached, I had a rolled up paper, and I, I should have just started yelling, but I didn't need it. Give him a goodness gracious sakes alive. That'll work. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So, uh, talking about John Wooden, how did uh, – how did a guy from Indiana overcome racism? Uh, was he through it? I mean, and this is the 40s. Well, that's a book. 
who are these Jews? These are the best questions anybody's ever asked. Those are some smart Jews. These are my people. Smart Jews in Dallas. Uh, wow. Uh, that's a great question. He's from Martinsville, Indiana, which is the home of the Klan. People don't know that. People think of Indiana as the Midwest, and it is. But there are parts of Indiana that are very much the South, and where John Wooden was from was that way. Uh, so how did he develop into the person? I, I, I don't have an answer to that. But somehow, and maybe when you're just in the midst of racism, you, 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 you have a choice to make. You know, that I'm either going to participate in the ugliness of that hateful, bigoted attitude, or I'm just not going to do it. And, uh, you know, he just, he just wasn't going to do it. Well, it was, was he a history teacher or English teacher? English teacher. English teacher. And, and by the way, very much saw himself as a teacher, not a coach. He, he did, everybody called him coach, but if you asked him what he did, he was a teacher. Another question we had was, do, did any of your teams have, have any race issues when playing in the South, like in Kentucky or Alabama? Uh, well, you know, we didn't go on the road very much. I mean, we had some internal race issues. Uh, you know, at one point in my junior year, the black guys all decided they didn't want a room with white guys and moved out on us. Uh, and it was very tense. We had some very, you know, we had to have some some heart to heart talks about, it. Uh, you know. But here we are, fifty years later, and we're still in the middle of, it, sadly. Yeah. So I'm going to ask. This is from somebody in the audience that said his girlfriend just asked, "Who is John Wooden, and how should he respond?" The greatest coach ever. There you go, Logan. <laughs> That's my son that asked that question. <laughs> I have to point him out. Now we've got to read the book, Mitch. Yeah, we've got the book. We've got. I the want book. a book report, man. I want. I want your son to do a book report now. Okay, we'll get that. So I just okay. want everybody to see. I've got Andy Hill's signature, and I've got Coach John Wooden's signature right there. Now you can get a copy of this book, but you can't get John Wooden's signature on it. You can get Andy's, but not John's. Uh, Coach Wooden's. So please order it. And uh, those are all the questions we had. Do you have any questions of us, Andy, that you want to? Not a doggone thing. <laughs> Not a doggone thing. It's been great spending time with you all. And, and, and uh, here, here's what I, I, I say to you, though, Mitch. If, if a bunch of these people read the book and then want to do a little book group, happy to do that, too. You just give me a call. <clears throat> That's so nice. We really okay. appreciate it. Yes, we really appreciate your time. And uh, again, I had my old coach who's on this uh, podcast or uh, lecture tonight, and uh, it, was, it was great talking to him today about it. And uh, we appreciate you spending time with us. And uh, now you also have a 50th anniversary coming up for the Correct. UCLA Bruins, right? Can you just tell us a little bit about that real quick? Right. My uh, 1972 team, which was... Last year, decided it was the greatest team ever. Our average margin of victory was 31 points a game for the season. Wow. Uh, we have our 50th, our 50th anniversary uh, on March 5th at, at halftime of the SC game. So that, and it will be my first time at, since COVID to be actually in a crowd. I, I'm immunocompromised and just got a kind of miracle vaccine called Evushell. So... I'm excited to be out in public for the first time. It'll be it'll be big. Well, that's great. A friend of ours who was on here tonight, Mark Andrus, will be at that game. He went to oh, good. Play. He told me he was going to that game. I don't know if he knows that that's the 50th anniversary of you guys, but he'll, he'll find there. out. Yeah, he definitely will. So thank you again, Deborah. I'm going to turn it over to you if you have anything else. Okay. Thank you all for coming, Andy. It was great to hear you. I look forward to getting a chance to hear more of your stories and reading the book. Hey, by the way, Deb, I got, I got to interrupt for just a sec because Mitch left something out. If you buy the book, the money goes to the Historical Society. Right. Right? 
What kind of a yes, fundraiser? Yes, it is strictly. You? It is strictly. I'm not, I, 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 I do the program. The book she says to sell program. for crying out loud. <laughs> That's why I'm money. not in sales, Andy. Okay. Uh, so yes, rush out buy the and book. get the book today. It's a straight donation, and um, we're. It includes if we have to ship it to you. We have. That includes the shipping, and we're happy to take care of that. Just call the office, or you can use the same link in the email you got today. That let you go to Eventbrite and, and purchase the book that way. Uh, Andy, it's been great. I look forward to hearing more stories. Thank you. Thank you, Mitch. You did a stellar job with the questions. And uh, I don't know if anybody in our audience has uh, any comments. Okay, can I just make one comment? Those were honest okay. to God, the most insightful questions any group has ever asked. And, and I find that I mean, if I may be, uh, you know, sort of uh, say something politically incorrect, I'm not surprised from a group of Jews. <laughs> Amen, brother. Bravo. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Keep an eye out for our next programs. We've got some other good ones coming up. Thank and you will get it in your email. All righty. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.